Production funding is provided by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the Citizens of Minnesota, the North Dakota Council on the Arts, the Bush Foundation, and the members of Prairie Public. Welcome to Prairie Mosaic. On this show, we'll visit with a potter, a painter, a storyteller, and a restorer. But first, let's journey to Purim, Minnesota, where Lina Bilar will take us on a tour of an interactive museum centered around the oral histories of area war veterans. Welcome to the ITOW Veterans Museum in Purim, Minnesota. This is a very unique museum that is based on the oral histories and the recorded stories of area veterans. My name is Lionel Bilar. I'm the executive director of the Friends of the History Museum of East Ottertail County. Most of these exhibits are very interactive. We have videos that you can watch that we'll just be repeating over and over again. We also have touch screens so you can choose different people to listen to. So it's a way to make it even more personal experience of the tour. And it's also a way to make it different every time that you come because you're not going to experience everybody's exhibit the first time through. So you can come through many times and hear different stories all the time. What you'll hear is stories from area veterans from all walks of life and all eras, from World War II, from World War I, from uh, Vietnam, and even the Cold War era and Korea, you know, telling you what it was like for them when they went to join the military or when they went into battle for the first time. Another friend of mine went down to St. Paul and we took her physicals. I passed and he had a spot in love when the army would take him. Because we're in a rural area, I think that experience is much more apparent and much more intimate than if you're often in an urban area where maybe things could happen next door you don't even know about. In a rural area, everybody sort of knows everybody, and I think that made it a different experience in terms of design. Many, many people in the community and the town uh, supported it and also the state. We were able to get some state funding and eventually get some federal funding for it because these are stories that transcend just what happened in Perm, Minnesota. The interviews come from people from probably 60 to 100 mile radius, but their stories are very universal because even if it wasn't your father that served in the Battle of the Bulge that you see, whose story you hear, perhaps you know someone who did. and. I've had people come through and say, now I know what my father would have told me had he lived to tell me. And so it becomes an experience that throughout the whole nation, people can relate to these stories because you knew someone who did have that experience. So we started collecting oral histories and we worked on that for a number of years and, and got some additional funding to broaden our base so that we were able to record more than just the local veterans but spread out a little further through the state and also to do a project recording women and ex their experiences not only in the military but also on the home front. 2004 we we're still thinking about where we might have this kind of museum and the VFW suggested that we use the existing VFW building as a museum so then we began actually doing the physical plans to put that together and create uh, what you see today. So when it came down to designing the Veterans Museum, we have a local architect that has done a great job with looking at ideas for the exterior and also some of the things on the interior. We opened the museum in the August of 2006 and we continued to make additions and additional exhibits to the museum. And of course, in our big uh, gallery, we have a documentary that plays all, all day, every hour on the half hour. But in addition to that, it's also a space where we have traveling exhibits. Perhaps you had a relative who served in World War II, but they never told you their stories. And you know, when you come here, you'll get an idea of what it was that they carried around in their heads and their hearts their whole life and perhaps weren't able to tell you. Each one of these men and women, they've served and they've served without question. Not because they wanted to or they wanted anybody else to do it, but because it had to be done. 
One of the great things about this museum in terms of providing a service to the public, I think it also provides a service for veterans because the chance to tell their story is, is a healing experience as well. And I think it's a way to help heal not only veterans, but the communities too, to understand what people go through to preserve their freedoms. Minnesota State University Moorhead professor Brad Bachmeyer is a ceramic artist who makes beautiful and diverse pieces of art using a potter's wheel and the Raku method of firing pots. The clay I'm using here is actually a commercially prepared uh, clay that comes from Minnesota. I buy it from Minneapolis and uh, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to wedge it and so I um, opened a business, bought a, bought a, a potter's wheel and, and uh, built a couple kilns and and started doing just some local craft fairs and things. And uh, from there, you know, literally I, I never would have saw it coming, but for the last 17 years I've never been able to make enough work and, and keep up with demand from uh, galleries and, and places, outlets that I've been selling. And that will prepare it um, so that it's ready to be thrown into a vessel on the, on the wheel. The process that I use in firing is what probably sets my work apart from um, many other pot potters and makes it a little bit more rare, and that is a, w one style that I'm well known for using is the ancient form of uh, raku, which is where you're firing pots to a red hot temperature around 2000 degrees, you're opening up the kiln, the pots are glowing red hot in there, and then you're pulling them out and immediately putting them in, in, a, in a reduction chamber. The other method that I use largely is pit firing, which is a very primitive method that was used since the very beginning of time by people all over the globe, and that is simply you know, digging a hole in the ground and putting your pots in there and throwing whatever materials you've got, whether it's cow dung or whatever materials you've got you know, available at hand to burn, and those pots maybe get up not to 2,000, not quite 2,000 degrees, but um, hard enough, hot enough to fire those things and make them permanent. I'm going to begin by opening a hole in the center, and so I'm taking my thumbs and pressing a hole in. So when I ask this clay to stretch, it's going to stretch a long ways and hold itself out all the way out here. Um, it takes a certain degree of, I suppose, control, and, um, and it is a little bit more difficult method of throwing plates and platters, but again, it, it results in a nice, elegant foot, a nice... A uh, light profile holding the needle tool still and I'm going to cut off a little bit of that rim just to ensure that it's nice and symmetrical all the way around. You know I can take this supporting it from underneath a little bit and press down and in one pass around the outside create a nice um, a nice even layer of marks. This piece is pulled out of the kiln at about 1200 degrees and you actually lay strands of horse hair on it. They sizzle and burn into the surface, carbonize into the, into the surface and leave nice fine black marks. I also lay some baling twine across there and that creates larger areas of smoke patterns. I think people are amazed when you say you're going into art or that you sell pottery and they assume that well who in the Midwest would buy it or that people around here you know, wouldn't appreciate it, and, and it's quite the opposite. Um, again, over 17 years, I've just never been able to make enough. It's not been the problem of selling it. It's, it's, and it's not because it's more tremendous work than anyone else's. I think people underestimate um, the sophistication of people around here and, and recognizing and collecting pieces. Holy Resurrection Orthodox Church in Sifton, Manitoba, had been unused and nearly forgotten for many years but an act of vandalism galvanized this rural community to bring the church back from the brink of destruction. We were sitting at the restaurant, a bunch of women and myself, and somebody came in and said, Vandals have broken into the church. We walk through the door, and as you walk in, there's a large red carpet. In the center of the carpet, the cross lay on the floor, smashed in two. There were cigarette butts, and there were pop cans and beer cans. The icons 
on the wall as you go into the Conestas were stabbed in the heart. The people felt such a feeling of sadness. It was just overwhelming to think, here's another thing that is lost, another part of the community, sort of the, the final nail in the coffin. I had my granddaughter with me, and she said, Grandma, why don't you fix it up? Why don't you patch the roof, paint the walls, and patch up the cracks? And I thought, what do we have to lose? We still all figured that there was no way, but we thought, well, we'll try. And so we tried one step and the next step and the next step. And the first thing to do was the basement, which was the biggest project. Uh, we got quotes that that was going to be $80,000. Well, how could we get $80,000? But we, we wrote to the government, so Hugh Ackland in Winnipeg with the Winnipeg Foundation and the Kaplan Fund, which of all is the Welch's grapefruit people out of New York City. Well, I would go and find these people and then I'd come back in the community and say, the Welch's grapefruit people out of New York City want to put some money into our church. And people would just shake their head. Why are you putting money into that old church when there's so much else to do? Why don't you fix the roads? So the first year they thought we were crazy. The second year, they were pretty sure we were crazy. We're going into our fifth year and the local people are starting to think that this is something pretty fantastic that the community did. This church now is coming alive once again. That first service that we had was an amazing thing to happen. The old people who were sure that they had lost their church, that they would never have a service in that church again. They came, and in the center, they put a picture of the Madonna, and people come up the carpet on their knees to kiss that picture. And there were the old people, the local men, the big macho men that you see in the coffee shop every morning, on their knees with tears in their eyes coming to see, kiss that picture because they thought that they would never see that happen. Mary Louise Defender Wilson grew up in a family of Dakota Hadatsa storytellers and midwives on the Standing Rock Reservation in Shields, North Dakota. She began telling her tribe's ancient narratives as a young girl. Mary Louise shares excerpts from the traditional story of the woman who turned herself to stone. I live in a rural area from a village called Porcupine, which is 30 miles west of Fort Yates, North Dakota. I've lived a long time. I was born in 1930, and I think during that time, I should have learned something, and I should be able to use that. I guess some of my recollections go back to sitting on top of this hill, which is to the south of where our house was. My grandfather was born in 1845, and he lived till I was seven. And I can remember sitting up there on that hill because we herded our sheep every day. It wasn't like now, you turned them loose and you didn't pay attention to them. We herded them every day and brought them back to the corral every night. And of course we had dogs that helped us. And some of the things I remember is him talking about something, something in the environment that maybe to me could have been insignificant at the time. But he would tell about it and would sometimes do things and build little structures with sticks and the earth. Because of my, my grandfather's age, older people always came to visit. I was really, really into really telling stories, but I always thought all my life, 
these people are so wise and they have such profound thinking. And they would tell, you know, we have two kinds of, uh, of stories, uhukaka, which are more like what is in English, you would say mythical events. And the others then were wichoyake, accounts of the people, which would be like our history. Usually the men would tell kind of like the historical things and the women told the more mysterious kind of things that they used to teach us with. By the time you hear the stories, you don't uh, think about the valuable lessons or maybe you don't even understand it or think about it. But after you get older, but then you realize that there's a wealth of wisdom, knowledge, and you know, like philosophy that you'll have for your life. The woman who turned herself to stone, she went through all of her years. She got to be a teenager. And then her family began to think that she should have her own family and live in her own lodge. And they began to talk to her about that, but she said, Hia de Togia Baunkta, I'm going to live in a different way, she said. But they insisted and they arranged a marriage for her because she was a very desirable person, a hard worker, kind, all the things that we value. So she married this man and went to live in her own lodge. Then she came back and Grandma said, Goodness, she said, isn't he good to you? Grandmother, she said, he's a fine man, treats me very well, but I told you I'm not meant to live like everybody else. And she left the lodge. It got to be toward evening, she didn't return. And Grandma got concerned. She said, she's not back. It's kind of bad. And she's not like that. She should come back. She never came back. The next morning, then Grandma said, you know, we have to go search for her. So she gathered all their relatives and friends, and they went off in the four directions to search for her. It was getting toward evening, and there's this little hill, and Grandma said, That's my grandchild. She was so happy. I can tell because she's sitting properly. So she ran up the hill, and she embraced her granddaughter. Here she could feel that her hip fell like stone. Grandchild, what's wrong with you? What's happening to you? We'll take you back to the village and maybe somebody can help you. You feel like you're stone. Grandmother, she said, I told you I'm supposed to live in a different way. And I'm turning myself to stone so I can stay out here forever. And all of these creatures that I think a lot of will all come by me. The coyote will come by and, and maybe rub up against me and the birds will come and sit around me. She named all the creatures because I think that they really are powerful and they're so good. So I'm going to become stone. But before I become stone, I'm going to tell you something. If you ever have troubles, problems, bring me something that has a root and put it beside me. Tell me what it is that you're having difficulty with and if I can, I will help you. She said that and she turned to stone. And that's the end of the story. In the beginning, they said when fawns were born, they were all one color, and they also smelled like deer. And on this particular day, while well, this doe was looking at her fawn, and she was feeling so sad, she said, she said, you poor thing, 
you may never grow up. Here all of a sudden the wind blew and the deer thought, this is a very different wind. I wonder what, what it means. But she was standing there looking at her fawn. And all of a sudden the wind spoke to her and said, I know that you're feeling bad about your child, so I'm going to help you. Dig some prairie turnips. These grow all over and peel them and take that and sprinkle it on your child's back. So the doe did that and the wind came and blew and the white spots then were imprinted on the fawn's back. And then the wind also told her, and I will take away that smell of the deer until it grows up and is able to run. So that is then how the deer are able to live. The secret to the vibrant landscapes painted by Jean Ranstrom of Alvarado, Minnesota is fresh air. If you would have the opportune day that you could ask for and say, okay, God, I'm going out to paint tomorrow and here's what I want. I would like about 65 degrees. I want no wind. I would like high overcast and no bugs. You would think you died and gone to heaven, but you might get one or two out of that list. Okay, well, this would be perfect. I am an oil painter and a pastelist. I basically started at 10 years of age. A neighbor lady asked my twin and I to come over and sit. She wanted to paint our portraits and I was completely intrigued with watching her put paint on a canvas. I have painted almost continuously, so I basically started at 10 years of age. I primarily paint still life, landscapes, do a lot of pet portraiture. I do not paint people. In the last years, plein air became something that was very, very important to me, and so I was outdoors painting a lot. So I am seeing, with all this yellow-green, I'm seeing a purple. Plein air painting means to be painting in the air, outside, and it is probably the fastest growing genre right now in the United States. It offers a tremendous amount of challenges. First of all, you have roughly a half hour to catch a light pattern in whatever it is you're painting. And then if you're able to edit everything out and only get in your lights, your middle tones, and your shadows, you can then work for approximately another hour on that piece and still have a sense of the time that you did this. And it truly is a skill builder. Other than the fact you need to watch for anthills and snakes and critters and bugs and rain and thunder and snow and those things. Plein air is really a lot of fun. To keep everything from getting wet. So we'll just kind of wait it out. My husband would be the very first one to tell you, if I get crabby, he just tells me to go to the studio. I can relax. I can have been out in the garden and be exhausted and come here into the studio and pick up a pastel or my paintbrush and my paint and for two hours I'm totally lost. It's like another world. I'm relaxed even when I'm struggling with a painting. As a painter what I feel is while you are trying to decide what color of green you need to put on that tree and where because you're totally absorbed in what you're doing. You cannot be worrying about whether the car is going to need to be repaired or whether you've got money for rent or some of the other daily problems that you have. And so for me, it is just like a fantastic relaxation. I paint pretty much what feels interesting and fun to me. And I think if I'm enjoying it, I'm hoping that somebody else will enjoy it. And so far, it's worked out pretty well. 
I probably could sell a whole lot more paintings if I did not follow my heart and what I really enjoy and want to paint. So I really don't paint for fashion at all. I think my biggest nightmare is people that would come into our studio and they would have all their swatches and they say, we need a painting to match the sofa. So I have a t-shirt that says, good art does not have to match the sofa. Production funding is provided by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the Citizens of Minnesota, the North Dakota Council on the Arts, the Bush Foundation, and the members of Prairie Public.